now we're rolling. <laughs> so good, man. We're really good right now, yo. I, yo, I want to say thank you for for coming on the podcast, bro. Oh man, um, I appreciate you having me, brother. Nah, cause um, uh, you know, my my biggest thing right now is is really trying to get minorities, you know, um, brown men, brown women, on the podcast as entrepreneurs doing their thing. You know what I'm saying? And that has a, a true story that people can relate, fucking relate to. Oh yeah. It? Of course, of course. Yeah, authenticity and, uh, is what has been like driving the whole, the whole narrative nowadays. I think people are really subscribing to authenticity. No, yeah, you're absolutely right, man. And and that's the whole point for myself, like with, with the podcast, and that's kind of like my little entrepreneurship type of thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, and um, and trying to get these stories out because I don't think there's no stories out there about us. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I feel um, you know, if I'm from Brooklyn, I'm Puerto Rican, you know, um, and it's just a matter of. I've heard a lot. I've seen a lot, but it's just I want to get the good stories out. You always say the bad shit. Yeah, I hear you. You know the. Go ahead, bro. I, I thought you were in a. I thought you were in Atlanta. I am in Atlanta. I, oh, I you're moved. from New York, though. I'm from New York, and um, I moved to Atlanta, and I love it. Atlanta is definitely my second home. Okay. You know what I'm saying? And living in Atlanta, you get to see a lot of black entrepreneurship, which I love. Oh yeah, absolutely. Atlanta. Atlanta's the true Wakanda. <laughs> 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 that's, funny. that's real though <laughs> yo for real like you, you people go to atlanta you're gonna see a lot of black owned businesses you're gonna see a lot of black entrepreneurs you're gonna see a lot of uh, black career-minded people you know what i'm saying yeah. and um which is awesome you're gonna see like neighborhoods and like you know affluent neighborhoods that's all black you know what i'm saying that's um deep. which it is you know what I'm saying? So it's if, if people have not come out to Atlanta yet, I strongly suggest you do because you can really see the real Wakanda <laughs> and, um, <laughs> yeah, and, and, so. and take advantage of it. You know what I'm saying? The culture is really getting is really getting, you know, uh, deep. They have a great hip hop culture. You know what I'm saying? Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. The, like the hip hop culture has been there strong for quite a while now. Atlanta has yeah. been a hub for for culture, for hip hop, for the, the the industry, music, for all of that, man. Absolutely. You know, now it's the biggest movie town in America. It's a past LA now. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, so a lot of the T V shows people watch, a lot of the movies are, mm-hmm. are done here. Like the Avengers were done was done here. Oh wow. um, yeah. So the studios been are popping up everywhere. A lot of a lot of Netflix shows and stuff people watch is done here. You know what oh, I'm saying? Wow. I didn't know that either. Yeah. So um it's just mad stuff like Jumanji, which filmed in, in Georgia. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, it's, that's, new, it, that's new news to me. Yeah. So, like, now it's, it's, it's this mecca of, of... Now, the biggest thing that's coming up is fashion. Oh, yeah. Of so, th- that's about the only thing that's missing in Georgia. Because, you know, you go to New York or to L.A., they got the three. They have the movies. They have the TV, movie, mm-hmm. music, and fashion. Yeah. Uh, well, Atlanta had the music. It's got the movies now. Now fashion, where we have Buckhead, Buckhead is our like kind of like our uptown, uh-huh. and um, it's where our our ritzy pippy people are at in Buckhead, and okay. uh, that's where um the fashion is starting to come really come out now, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. that's gonna be the next move. I, I can see with the next ten years, where it's really it may be less than that, where some true movement is gonna happen, and then Atlanta's is gonna kill the rest of the country because it just has the proper weather, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It kind of has that kind of perfect, you know, perfect storm scenario. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I like so, that. Yeah, man. Like, I always let people know that you also are a veteran too, man. Like, I want to say thank you for serving. Like, that's that's some dope shit. Like, thank you for protecting me and shit. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Man, you know what? I appreciate everybody's support, man. Because I know, like, not a lot of people agree with some of the things the military does or is tasked to do. So I always appreciate it whenever somebody can show support, man. I appreciate it for sure. No, yeah, definitely. So, what what made you like go to the military? Like, um, uh, like straight out of high school, I was just I was not the best student. Um, I tried college, I tried community college for a little bit, and that just wasn't working for me either because I really just end up going to basketball practices and not really going to classes. So that career ended rather quickly. And then I actually had my daughter at a very young age. So I had my daughter when I was a senior in high school. And uh, I dabbled in the streets a little bit. Um, I had got arrested a few times. And then I just ended up realizing that I wanted to make a change. I just didn't know which direction I wanted to go. So I literally, like, met my my recruiter 
for the Marine Corps in the barbershop. He sat down next to me in the chair. I was, I was, I was getting my hair cut, and he just asked me what I was doing. And I was like, man, I'm in these streets right now. You know what I'm doing? Like, I'm not trying to keep it a secret. And he was just telling like, hey, come have a conversation with me. So I went up to the, the recruiting station. You know, he asked me what direction I wanted to go in my life. And he just sold me. Like, he didn't sell me the dream. I won't say that, but he just sold me on the Marine Corps. Like, it's morals. It's code of ethics. It's small unit leadership. It's uh, access to education. It, like the whole the whole the whole ideal so i just ended up literally i was talking to him on monday in uh or rather was it monday it was i was talking to him on monday in the recruiting office and that thursday of that week i was like in boot camp oh damn that fast it was that fast brother this was at the height of the war this is 2004 so okay they really so they were recruiting real quick through yeah. the process rather quickly right. so yeah man i just realized i wanted to change and i felt like the marine corps was that change for me and like ever since then, I've been a firm advocate for the military, like the the Marine Corps, because you know I'm, I'm a little bit biased, obviously now, but I'm a firm advocate for the Marine, like for the military. It, it changed my life, man, uh, right. like in a in a real positive way. Like it changed my life. It's the best decision I ever made in my life, hands down. You know, and to, I remember one time I've seen a uh, one of those recruiting kind of SUVs they have. It had like a plasma TV. It like some like they pimped out their ride. Yeah, <laughs> and <laughs> so I was like, "What?" It had it had rims on it, and it was what I was actually an army recruiter. It was like a, a like a black uh, Tahoe. It was it was it was it was dope though. It was a badass, yeah. and, and but I guess they had to um, cause they were in, in a bad neighborhood too. They were at the front of a, of a bad mall, okay. and I guess they had to kind of uh, appease to the to the to the to the kids. You know what I'm saying? I guess uh, what they're into. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. So I guess they tried it. <laughs> there are some instances where, you know, recruiters go to odd lengths to try to sell you their version or your version of what you think is ideal for you. I think um, so. I, I, I've, I've had I've ran into instances where that's the case, you know, but there's a lot of misconceptions regarding the military. And I think it, it kind of brings fear. It puts fear in some people's hearts about whether it's a good choice for them or not. And then once they're in, I think they realize that not everybody goes to war. I think one of the major misconceptions is that we make a lot of money and we don't. <laughs> no, not at all. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> so I've never heard that misconception. I already knew that. Yeah. My uh, father was in the military. He was in the army. He made shit. Shit, bro. They don't, we don't make like literally the military as a whole is the most overworked, underpaid t employment force in America. <laughs> right. Absolutely. <laughs> Hands down. We don't make anything. You're, you're forced to work crazy hours you're forced to do anything you're told essentially it's it's ridiculous when you think about it from that aspect and the raises go up like per like a, a point of a percent every year for the military as a whole and it's nothing when you talk the grand scheme of things it's nothing to pay and the goal is to just kind of accelerate through those e-classes right like you know that continue to go higher and higher i guess to try to achieve more and get more right yeah i mean there's e-classes so that's like the enlisted side of the house and then there's the officer side of the house which pays right. a little bit better because you come in with some additional education that most enlisted people don't but um yeah the the the, the goal is to basically ascend through the ranks as quickly as possible like me per personally my story i went from e1 to e5 in a matter of three years, I went from E1 to E4 in a year and a half. That's that's like, that's that's crazy, bro. It's like, like, at the time, was unheard of. Like, right. you know, so like, <clears throat> but I literally, uh, like, in my, I still remember to this day, like it was yesterday. I was sitting in boot camp, and I'm like, man, I, the drill instructor was explaining how the rank structure works, and explaining how the pay works, and then just explaining the the entire concept of like being in the fleet after the, after you leave boot camp. And the, the, my thought that ran through my head is I'm going to do whatever it takes to move up the rank structure as quickly as possible. And when I got to my first duty station, that's exactly what I did. I, I was, we had a board that ranked all of the, the, the new individuals that came into the unit that as, far, as far as their physical fitness was concerned, rifle scores, how much education they have accrued in a, a six-month window, uh, all of that. And I was at the top of that board in every single aspect of the game. So I literally went from E1 to E4 in a year and a half. As soon as I was able to be promoted, I got promoted. And then wow. from, it took me another 
a year and a half to get to E5 just because I didn't have the time and grade or the time and service and time and grade to get to the next rank. And then I picked up E6 as soon as I was eligible for that. And that was only eight years, which was still like rather quick. I mean, this, just think about the structure only goes to, from one to nine. I right. Was over half of the structure in three years. So that's insane, bro. You were killing it. I was just driven, man. I was literally just driven. Besides the fact that I was just, I was, I wanted to be a leader and I wanted to be first. And I was just super ambitious about what I was doing in the moment. When you move up the rank structure, less people can tell you what to do, and that's always a good thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because <laughs> there's a lot of idiots in the in the military, in the Marine Corps for sure as well. So when you move up the rank structure, like less people can tell you what to do, and that's always a plus. And I think that's something that people don't understand. Like you know, I've, you know, because you come out the military, it doesn't make you any smarter. Not at uh. all. <laughs> Not at all. And, and there's a lot of misconceptions about like the branches on the individual basis as well. Like the Air Force is smart. The Marine Corps is dumb. Right. The Navy's required to, to to know how to swim. Like the Army is just kind of the grunt force. But there's a I've met a, it's all on an individual basis, man. I've met a I've met a lot of smart Marines and dumb Air Force people. I've met yeah. Navy people who don't know how to swim. And it's kind of <laughs> weird, but like because right. they don't all end up on ships, so it's not really a requirement, you know. Like, no, yeah, you're gonna have a life preserver anywhere, right? So yeah. you have a life vest on and you're gonna get another boat and <laughs> and if you're if you're at war. It really doesn't matter if you know how to swim or not. You're know, probably going to sink yeah, no, so, I mean, you're going to be on the ground. Like, this most recent campaigns were just on the in uh, like urban environment. So you, you really didn't need how to know how to survive in the jungle. You didn't really know how to, need to know how to do any of that. It was just like, I got my training, some better than others, given the branch. And then you, you get sent to the forward to support the mission, whatever aspect your MOS was concerning. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So you you spent what like about a decade in in the military? Yeah, man, ten long years. But that's how long it took because not only did I have a game plan for like my military career, I had a game plan for my professional career and what I wanted to do when I got out of the military. Because a lot of people get out of the military without an idea of what they really want to do when it's all said and done, and the safety net of having your meals provided for you, healthcare, dental, insurance is removed. Like all right. of that is gone the moment you say sign the papers and and say you no longer want to serve like they're done with you there's no more what? unless you unless you're right. a disabled veteran and then there's some support obviously what what I've what I've have in the past compared it compared it to a lot of people disagree with me but I've always compared it when some when a, when a veteran leaves the military for the first time and comes back to civilian life is they come out of jail it really is I, I, that's the but bro that's the best comparison I swear to you in my life I compare it to that a lot. Like, jail is not much different than coming out of the military if you've been in for a long time. Right. Because you're being provided everything. You're being pro- like you're being told what to do on a daily basis. And now you have to go back to your you have to find your individuality again. And some people have a hard time doing that. Like and then they end up with those people on the side of the road that say, hey, I'm a veteran. Can you help out with like a cardboard sign? Yeah. Written magic marker and shit. Yeah, you know? yeah, no doubt. And like, and, and, it, and, and it's sad, but it's true. They just never find their way once the safety net is removed, you know? No, but absolutely. Me, it just took me 10, it literally took me 10 years to like have the roadmap I set out for me on an individual basis to come to fruition. So like after my first five years, I wanted, even though I wanted to get out because I just wasn't in the right space, I wasn't in the right unit. I just knew I didn't, be, I couldn't because I didn't have, I hadn't brought my plan in, like the plan that I had for me in, 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 on an individual basis, it had not taken effect yet. So I, I reluctantly signed up for another five years. I got a nice little bonus to do it. And then in that last, I would say two years before I was able to reenlist or get out again, when I came to that crossroad, I just put my head down and focused on myself, man. I, like, I, I really decided to just be selfish like, I know what I want to do. I'm probably going to transition out here. This is what I need to do. So I just started, like, getting certificates. I started working on my resume real hard. I started applying for jobs. I started asking some of my peers who I was working uh, alongside, hey, like, what does your resume look like? Can I see it? Like, send it to me. Let me try to just see what I can take off of it. I got three certificates that were uh, applicable to my job, like my career field. 
uh, like right back to back in like a six month period. I got A plus, Net plus, Security plus. I got my Microsoft NTA certificate, and I finished my associate's degree in computer science, like all in that same time span, because I knew I wanted to make I needed to make myself marketable against my peers, and at the moment I wasn't. So I just put my right. head down and just worked on it, man. That's that's phenomenal, bro. That's kudos to you, bro, for that, because that's a lot. Because like you said, a lot of people don't have a plan. You know, they decide not to uh, enlist again, and they go home with a duffel bag. Like that's it. <laughs> that's it. Man. And for anybody listening to this, if you're a veteran, like if you're transitioning out, saying I'm going to go to school is not a plan. <laughs> that's right. not a plan. If that if that's your option, that's your first response when someone asks you. So what are you going to do when you get out of the military? Stay in because you're not ready to get out. Right. You're not. And that's, yeah. I mean, it's, that's the hard truth, man. I, I, I hear so many people say that, like, what are you going to do when you transition out? And they'd be like, oh, I'm just going to go to school. That's not, you don't have a plan then. That's not a plan. Because no. eventually the money that you get, first of all, the money you get for school is based on where you're at geographically. It might be fucking dick. Like it might be $1,300 of BAH. You wow. can't live off of $1,300 a month. I don't no. care who you are. Not no, in America. Not so, I was I was not aware that it was based off of that. It was just kind of just yeah, one lump sum. It's yeah. not a flat fee for you to go to school. They're gonna pay for your books. You're gonna you, tuition, all of that. But the, the the BAH, the housing allowance that they allow you to to go to school is it's different everywhere. So it may be a couple thousand dollars. It may be a thousand dollars. It may be a couple hundred dollars. You know what I mean? So like right. you have to really think about it. Think about doing something other than going to school if you're gonna transition out. That's not the answer. So do you feel with the military that the 10 years, if you didn't decide to to go after what you want to go after, did it really prepare you to come out back to civilian life or did it not care? Was it was the military not designed for that? Did it just designed to say, hey, you're going to protect America and that's it. And if you want to go after something else, you can. You know, you see what I'm saying? Like, you know, like did the military ever say, you know, this is what civilian life is. Is there anything like a transition period for people who want to, like, say, I'm going to transition out of the military? Because same thing with people who are in jail, right? There's no transition them to back into civilian life. So what does yeah. that look like for, for folks? Um, so essentially, like, there is a transition assistance program, that, but they really give it to you, like, on the tail end of your career or whatever. You know, if you're doing four years or doing ten years, it doesn't really matter. You're receiving the same information as everyone else and honestly a lot of what i can remember from that class was not really relevant to what i really was trying to do i mean they, they provide you with some resources like um <laughs> just like little job little job billets and, and like uh, bulletins and stuff like that you could sign up for and newsletters you could sign up for i think they had like a guy come in and tell you how to dress on your first interview and they, they help you with like a rudimentary resume but a lot of the information is it is fairly rudimentary honestly in, 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 at its core so it's just not as helpful as if you decide what you want to do way ahead of that and then start to research and pull your own resources together to make that happen i think All right yeah so let me ask you about the colin kaepernick right yeah Real quick, because a lot of people, and for myself, I love the fact he took the stand. I love the fact that you know he know, you know, still respected to me. Mm-hmm. He still did a respect a respectful uh, stance. Because to me, I don't think he's disrespecting the military because the flag doesn't just represent the military. Yeah, it course. represents America as a whole, all his people. So, what do you, what do you, what's your take on that? Since you're since you're a veteran, um, personally, like I. <laughs> Me and my brothers and sisters in the military, I've never once had a conversation that was evolved around Colin Kaepernick and his, like, stance. But I guess my take on it is I don't feel disrespected. I feel like he has the right to to do whatever he wants to do with his platform. Like, he's someone that's in the public eye. If he feels like taking a knee during the Pledge of Allegiance is a way to, like, build – brand awareness for his acts his cause i say more power to it and besides that like his cause is is honorable is honorable as hell you know what i mean he's standing up against police brutality he's standing up for minorities and the way we're getting treated in this country and 
honestly, I think a lot of the in people in this country and other positions of, of authority, of power, that have platforms that like to keep that type of injustice under the rug. They would like to keep that type of the, the fact that that's going on in this country in the dark. So him doing it and bringing it to the light, like it's going to cause a lot of those individuals that are on the reverse side of that or that may be ignorant to it to put it, to make a spin on it. It's all for media, bro. I feel like the fact that they made it a negative thing is just because negativity sells better than positivity when you talk about the media and the news, you know? Absolutely. No, I totally agree. I, 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 and that's why I don't understand how, you know, um, you know, he, he got blackballed from the NFL, which makes no damn sense. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Does. But, of course, <laughs> it's all white ownership, right? So until, you know, we get some brown people in ownership, you know, that's not going to change. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's Unfortunately, that's just true. I mean, because there's no way that he's a worse quarterback than some of the individuals that are putting on the uniform nowadays. Especially when you when you think about it, like that guy from the Jets. What's the quarterback from the Jets with the beard, man? Oh, I know who you're talking about. I I I don't oh, remember his name. His name escapes me, but uh, he threw like six interceptions in a game. Like, yeah. Come on, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, if you don't sit him down and put Colin Kaepernick in, like I don't under, like to me, I don't understand that. But it is what it is, man. Like you said, there's a lot of individuals who don't agree what he was doing that are in positions of leadership inside the NFL. So whenever they get at a round table and decide to keep you out, you're out. <laughs> no, absolutely, man. Yeah. No, absolutely. Like, you know, and, and I think, you know, he has his uh, sponsorship with Nike right now, which is great. So yeah. he has a campaign going with them and, you know, he's doing a lot of awareness, uh, which is fantastic. I don't, I don't think that, you know, of course he doesn't get the proper coverage, you know, that he needs to get for it. Yeah. Um, but you know, his name is always being spoken about. And I think that's our job as a people to continue that much of it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think so too, man. I think it's our job as a people to just further any positive narr- narrative that will help us all as a whole. And like just prevent, like or just rather put equality in front versus negativity and all that extra stuff that's going on in America right now. No, absolutely, bro. Like, absolutely. So, you know, you just as a kind of track back a little bit, you know, you said that, you know, after you knew you were in a balance after a decade in the military, yeah. you know, you started getting certifications and stuff, and you knew you had an idea of what your career was. Um, how long before you started kind of dabbling in entrepreneurship? Um, so I got out of the military in 2014, and I think hmm, 2000. 15, 2016, I started, um, I started one of my own, I, I opened up my own business. So I had a, I owned a tattoo parlor in a barbershop within the first maybe year and 10 months of actually being out of the military. Wow. Um, so what was that process like? The, the process essentially was rather quick, right? Cause I, I, I'm one that just operates with speed. Um, so I was, and I was getting tattoos. I was trying to re- like, in a, essentially, I was in a stage where I was like trying to reclaim my body because I haven't been able to do whatever I wanted to do with my body for ten years. So I got extra holes pierced in my ears. <laughs> I started right. getting additional tattoos, and then I was living in a in a part of Virginia where it was just hard to find or to lock in an appointment to get a tattoo. So I went over to this one spot, and uh, based on a recommendation of a friend. And we go in there, and I'm just like, I'm getting my tattoo, and I'm looking around, and I was like, man, this place is, uh, it's kind of run down. Like, where's the owner at? And, and my tattoo artist is telling me, yeah, uh, the owner is Tommy. Shout out to Tommy Tats, man. The owner is Tommy. He, uh, he's looking to sell the place, so he's rarely here. So I was like, man, you should give me his contact information, so I can, uh, I can lock in with him. We can have a conversation. I, I see a lot of potential in this space. Right. And uh, as we were having that conversation. Tommy walks in the shop. <laughs> That's so uh, I'm talking to Tommy and we're having a conversation and then we, we decided to have another sidebar. Um, we went out and had, got something to eat and we're talking. And uh, I think maybe three weeks after that conversation, uh, I gave him cash up front. And I bought the shop. I bought the location from him. How I much, that, how much that, did, I, did I run for a tattoo shop? Um. So it was all in, it was an all encompassing shop. So it was like a barber shop in the front and then a tattoo parlor in the back. So okay. um, all up front, it cost me like twenty eight thousand, 
And like I tell people this, like this, this is and this is true. This is a true statement. I literally emptied my savings account down to seventy five cents to yeah. buy the location. No, no loan, no nothing. I asked the, I went to the bank. They told me to kick rocks. Like they were not having it because right. the banks essentially, when you go to get a loan, the banks don't want to invest in upstarts. Banks want to invest in businesses that are already existing are already and showing returns. Exactly. Yeah. So like they, they don't want to, they don't want to invest in your dreams. They want to invest in your successful business. So when I went in there to, to talk about a loan and they just told me to like basically essentially just get out, come back when you were successful. <laughs> so I emptied my bank account down to 75 fucking cents, brother. From the moment I took it over, like to where it was before, it looked like a completely new space. I created the whole virtual presence. I created a website. I made it easier for users to interface with the website. Like everything, I made it like my vision. Right. And I ran it for three years. Not once did I have to come out of pocket to pay the rent. Uh, it was fairly profitable. There was ups and downs in it. But um, after the three years of running it by myself, I sold it to one of the, my tattoo artists. So um, currently, I'm from I'm out from underneath it. Um, I still get calls on occasion, but yeah, I sold it to one of the guys that um, was tattooing at my spot. He had just got out of jail. I, I saw he was hustling. He asked me if I if I was be willing to sell it to him at some point, and I said, sure. Show me your hustle. Show me your grind. And then if you come up with the cash, I'll give it to you, bro. And I sold it to him for twenty thousand after making. Uh, a profit on it for three years so initially I, I essentially i came out ahead in the whole in the whole deal right yeah and he, and, and he, and he got the hookup too so and he got the hookup so I, I basically like i bought it as is and then i sold it to him as is so right. now when i go in there to get tattoos from him like it looks like a completely new space because he and I, he he created his vision of how he wanted the space to look so it's right. it's, it's completely changed faces three times in the past like five years they're, they're like the actual physical location but that's what's up. Like you knew, you knew when you went. You knew when you you knew when you were done, right? You had your vision. You did yeah. it. You learned from some of the headaches. You said, "Oh you know, yeah, man." What was what were some of the trying times that really kind of put your back against the wall? Man, so I guess the first obstacle was just the fact that we were a new. Like it was like the word got out on the street amongst the tattoo tattooers and a lot of the individuals in that community that we were a new establishment, like under new management. So we got a lot of really weird <laughs> people coming in there asking for employment, um, asking the tattoo in there and trying to like vet your way through those individuals that are kind of shady and the ones that have uh, like genuine intentions to like help you grow your business can right. get shady. Sometimes I almost had, the, I've almost gotten into fights with people because I told them they can't work here. Like I've gotten into altercations with people about uh, like, money that they paid at one of my tattoo artists because they don't work for me they're general contractors they work on like a 1099 type of pay scale right they say this like a barbershop yeah. yeah it's like they're not my employees but you know people come in hey i gave the tattoo artist uh money up front now i can't get a hold of him where is he where's the owner and then you have to like try to diffuse a lot of that stuff like it, it, it had to be like a bit of a headache and then I, I hired one of my friends from the marine corps um and he just wasn't doing the job the way I wanted to do it. So I had to, like, basically tell him to uh -huh. kick rocks, even though he's still the homie. You know what I mean? So, like, that was hard. And um, one time my shop actually got robbed, so I had to fight through that. Like, it, it, it's a lot of ups and downs, man. Uh, but I think, like, whenever you embark on something and you're betting on yourself and you're doing it based off of deafness, like, I have no actual educational training on how to run a business. I'm doing it based off the fact that, I'm just of my own research and my own know-how. So there's going to be some trial and error. So, you know, you get robbed, um, you, <laughs> you put, you put a, you, you put a bigger safe in the back, you know, right. <laughs> so that, that's, what, that's what we did. You, know, you put some cameras on the inside so I could take a look at it from my phone. You know, you adjust. It yeah. happens. It's business, man. So, no, I, so, so those three years were kind of your, your Harvard business schooling. <laughs> yeah, man. I don't think there's, there's no, there's no better way to learn than to like right. actual actually be doing it so um yeah like i took some l's man and and it just is what it is like those are my l's i owned them you know i had people tattoo artists like jet on me in the middle of the night type shit like i like i'm saying what's up with them dapping them up and during the day and i come in the next day all their shit is gone like no word no nothing Damn. <laughs> like, it happens it's just like tattoo artists like you know 
they they fancy themselves entrepreneurs as well to a, to a certain extent so they want to work right. when they want to work and where they want to work and they can yeah. literally pick up and go in a fucking instant so like if they find right. a better opportunity you know they run towards that you know but yeah they they, they got to run to the next hot spot exactly so like i had the hot spot for a while i had like really good yelp reviews so people were coming in trying to work for me like leaving other shops to come in here and work and come work for me but then you know when it kind of fizzled down in the slow periods like winter time fall whenever people just don't get tattoos as much um right. it's just they would run to the next hot spot the next new location or the next per they know somebody tattooing over here they would make a recommendation so they would follow follow the crowd you know so right. it happens man but I don't regret it. I don't regret it at all. Like it was, it was essential. It was a really hard experience for me to try to get through. Um, but there was a lot of learning in it. And I don't take it. I wouldn't take it back for anything. And there were long days, bro. A lot of like blood, sweat, and tears of energy went into that, like building it up as a brand from base. Essentially, it wasn't from grassroots because I inherited a space that was already kind of populated as far as equipment and stuff like that. Right. But like, I had to create my own working capital. So I was working two jobs at the time. I worked a night job. I worked a day job. And then every single penny that I made from the business for that first year and a half went back into the business. So Mm -hmm. it had, it was like, it was a hustle, man. I I missed out on a lot of sleep and I made a lot of sacrifices to make that thing go. But like I said, man, in the three years that I owned it, I never once had to come out of my own actual pocket to like pay the rent or got behind on bills or utilities or none of that stuff like i i made it work so that that first year and a half you didn't take a salary at all then i didn't i wasn't paying myself i was i was only putting money back into the business and um because it was still kind of like fine-tuning um percentages and commissions from the tattoo artists and then trying to figure out okay what's my budget for supplies this month uh what bills do i have to cover and how much is it going to be and then I had like a, I had bought a vending machine and put a vending machine in there. So that became a part of like one of the income streams. Essentially, like it was a small space. So I was, the entire time I had it, I was trying to maximize the earning potential of every freaking inch of the space. And it was just a learning curve, you know? So like, yeah. that's why I said I had to knock down some interior walls and do all that extra stuff because I wanted to create more space to create more income for this, for the, the brand, you know? Yeah. So when you sold it to the tattoo artist that was working for you for 20 G's, what was your next move? What was, what, did you have a plan? You know, you had your fill with that project. What was your next project? Um, so the next project was going to be to work on uh, a mobile application idea that I was, I was conceptualizing. Okay. Um, <laughs> and I worked on that for a while. Um, it, I think trying to like make bring something like a mobile application from like conception to consumption is a much harder process because there's just so much competition in the market you know what i mean like it, right. it would be hard for someone even a lot of these really successful applications like there was a version of uber before uber came out there was a version of uh Instagram, there was a version of Facebook, like MySpace. Obviously, those right. of us a little bit older know MySpace was Facebook like 10 years yeah, ago. Exactly. So it, it's hard to create something new. Like there's very little white space when you talk about mobile applications and stuff. So it's just like the process was just not that it was just taking a long time because I'm always down to put in the grind and put in the work, but it was just hard to find some white space to really create something. But I essentially I had came up with an idea that I thought would kind of work on a regional level. And okay. it was basically like a share network. So essentially what it was like, I, I named it, I had called it paid to post. So it was like, uh, there's a lot of parties out here in DC. There's a lot of clubs. There's a, a lot of uh, stage venues that throw a lot of concerts and such. So I was like, look, man, I had did some research and I found out that essentially a large percentage of individuals who found out about an event in a city found out about it via a friend and like these people aren't really tuned into radio advertisements they're not tuned into uh ad space as much i don't think uh, on right. Instagram because they are tuned into what their friends are doing so if their friends post something they're probably going to see it so i was like look man i think if we create an algorithm in which you pay people a small fee to post something to their page i think the return on investment to getting for getting eyes on the, the event 
um, would come in the back end of like ticket sales and that type of thing. And then if you didn't want to get paid to actually post something, you could actually just use it for access to the venue, the concert, whatever the case. Gotcha. Um, so I created some stuff for it. I created a website. I created a business model, all of that, because I feel like having an idea is one thing, but then like making it tangible is another thing. So I put it on paper. Um, and then I was actually able to leverage, um, some face to face time to present my, uh, idea and my concept to Gary Vaynerchuk. Are you aware of who he is? Absolutely. So I leveraged some, uh, face to face time with him via his Twitter and I got a meeting with Gary. So I took my idea up to New York. I flew up to New York. I took my idea to Vayner Media, and I'm sitting down in front of the man himself. Uh, and I know that he's one of my like real life heroes. Like I'm so subscribed to his narrative. It's not even funny. So so am I. Um, <laughs> and people who know who Gary V is, Gary V is a super uber entrepreneur. He started out actually beginning in YouTube with Wine Library. Exactly. Uh, back in the day, and then he actually left YouTube to go to this other um, uh, startup. It's funny how you're talking about another another app. Yeah. Well, he went to to kind of a, a competitor of YouTube that was around back in the day that failed. Yeah. And um, but he made his his father's liquor store very successful from mm -hmm. a three million dollar um, intake to sixty. Oof. Um, and it's still going strong to this day. And then um, he wound up becoming um, you know, just super, like, he, he doesn't call himself a motivational speaker, mm -hmm. um, which he really isn't, but he is motivating, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and he built his own media company called Corvina Media with his brother, I believe. Yes, he did, yeah. And, um, yeah, he's, he's fucking amazing. Um, you know, he wants to buy the Jets. His long-term goal is to buy the fucking Jets, <laughs> yeah. you know? And, um, I, I think that's amazing because the fact that, you know, for yourself, we're talking about and seeing someone that, that went through it like himself. And he's he, he even has his own fucking shoe, K Swiss. Yeah. You know, so, so it's 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 dope to see that an entrepreneur is so culturally accepted and aware, unlike years in the past. Like me growing up, you you never heard the word entrepreneur. No. You know what I'm saying? And no. let alone you followed them in a way that they were almost like a rock star. Yeah. You know what I'm saying, which is insane. So I'm sorry to cut you off. I just wanted to give people some clarity. You know, who yeah, Gary v is. obviously, yeah. Like, like if they don't know who Gary V is, like at Gary V E E, v. like follow him. I'm telling you, like if you need some inspiration, if you need some direction about where you want to be, if you have entrepreneurial expectations, like like aspirations rather, like follow Gary V, man. He, like he'll he'll punch you in the right direction for sure. Like he's giving away the game for free. Yes. Like for free. <laughs> like yeah. you don't have to pay anybody like consume his content. Like it's all free. Like all you have to do is tune in and listen. Yeah. Right? I have I have all his books. So it's wow. like, yo, like it's insane. I've learned I learned I've learned a lot. Um and I've I've applied it to, to, to my to my direction and the way I'm gonna apply it to, you know what I'm saying? So it's like um you can't copy his his thing, but nah. you can definitely use it to apply it to your thing. You know what I'm exactly. saying? So Exactly. And I'll, like, it's funny that you mentioned the shoes because that's how I like actually gained the leverage to, to be able to sit in front of him. So he posted on his Twitter. He said, my case with shoe drops in less than 24 hours. Who's going to buy a pair? And I tweeted at him and said, I'll buy 30 pairs if you give me 15 minutes of your time in a business meeting. And he shot me his email address and we locked it in like right away. Damn, bro. <laughs> so yeah. did you buy the 30 pairs? I did. I bought the 30 pairs. Goddamn. <laughs> I didn't know at the time it cost a hundred dollars each. So, but, oh, <laughs> but I spent the three racks. I bought the shoes. Uh, he, he, um, I had to send him the receipt of the purchase. Um, so I sent him the receipt and we locked in the date, man. And like, um, next thing I knew I was on my way to New York to actually talk to him about my idea. So I sat down in front of him and I pitched him my idea and he, Basically, I, so I went into it with no expectation, right. but essentially when I gave him my idea, he was just kind of like, uh, this is not going to work. And like, like that was the end of that part, that part of the meeting. And, I, and, he, and he told me why. He's like, essentially, it's not going to work because this is not the way social media was designed to function. It's like a reverse function of it. And if you build brand awareness for this and it's something successful, 
Instagram will probably make it illegal and steal it from underneath you. You know what I mean? So, like, if it's something that works, it's going to be good for a little while. And then before Instagram decides that sees that it's working and steals it from you, or it's just not going to work because it's not the way social media was designed. So, um, after he told me that, I, I kind of just... I told him what how where I had came from that I had some money that I was sitting on because I had just sold my shop, um, and then he just asked me what I was passionate about. Like he was like, "Bro, you're smart. Like you wouldn't be sitting here in front of me if you weren't." Like, but I feel like like I I can I, I can tell you're not passionate about this. Like, and he changed my whole mindset from in that moment because he told me like you have to visualize what brings value to people versus what makes money. Like money will come. But once you find what you're passionate about and what you're passionate about brings value to people, that's how you win. Right. So ever since then, man, I've just been kind of being quiet. I've been listening to the universe. I feel like opportunity and preparation align so beautifully that whenever an opportunity does present itself to me, I'll have some working capital to, th- to throw at it. And so that's what I've kind of been doing at the moment, man. So in the meantime, I'm just working. I'm building more. I'm, I'm, I'm spreading. I'm spreading my particular brand of hustle and motivation on social media, uh, and just kind of just been waiting for another opportunity to really be able to set my foot back in the entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur. You know. No, and that's fantastic. I think, and that's where some people have to understand too. Like, um, it's not it's not a very continuous type of thing where it just jump from one thing to another. Yeah, Sometimes so- it's okay. I did this. I may have to take a little break why I reformulate the next move. Yeah. And that's very real. That's 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 just real life. Yeah, man. But it's it, it, it's it's so hard to be patient when you're know you're an entrepreneur at heart like me. I I I know I'm an entrepreneur at heart. Like I I say a lot of the same things people who I idolize say before I even hear them say it. Like I I I find myself thinking the same way Gary Vee thinks. And, right. and it, not that I found that like I'm likening myself to him because he's just he's so much like he's so far beyond how, how I can even ever imagine myself as an entrepreneur. But I just find myself whenever he says something like if it, it, it like it gives you that that aha moment, you know what I mean? Like definitely the, the fucking light bulb goes off. I'm like, damn, I've been saying that whole thing, like that same thing to myself in some way, shape or form. Like I know I'm on the right path. You know what I'm saying? No, absolutely. I told you this. This is like myself right now. You know, I I I write. I wrote two books last year. Oh, cool. You know what I'm saying? I put on I put it on Amazon myself. One core purpose. It was actually based off my Instagram account. So I I, I was doing this kind of inspirational, you know, picks. And what I yeah. did was I wrote a page or two off of that pick. And I you know I put the pick on the page and I wrote like two pages worth of more like kind of dialogue explaining okay. about that pick. Yeah, and yeah. then I wrote a kind of a small kind of almost like an essay called Inside Out. And uh, that one was more about, um, you know, really taking care of yourself on the inside before you worry about your outside. You know, Absolutely. Fit. Everyone so always worries about the fitness and stuff, but no one works on their mental game or was really fucking around with them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And now I'm working on my passion project, which it's actually an urban love story called Brooklyn Love. Okay. And so I've been I wrote it eight years ago. Yeah. And I got 22 chapters in, and I'm gonna pick. P- I'm gonna start st- this month. Actually, start promoting it for end of year. So I'm gonna put a challenge on myself. I got to finish the rest of this fucking book, and then um, <laughs> put it yeah. out there. And then the podcasting kind of just happened, bro. I'm I'm loving what I'm doing with it. It's yeah. actually growing month over month which is crazy, and I'm in people's DMs. I'm sliding in people's DMs like, I don't, I don't give a fuck. It's yeah, like... bro, I saw that. <laughs> it, you know, you know I, I got a lot of DMs, like, so, so random. <laughs> like, hey, can you listen to this music? Like, hey, can I come open up for your club? Like, right. but so like, I didn't, I wasn't following you back, so I, I didn't see your DM for a while because it goes into that, like, that subcategory of, like, messages. Right. But when I saw it, I was initial, like, I was right off the back intrigued, even though I kind of, like, slow played you. I yeah. was like right off the back intrigued. I was like, oh yeah, podcast for sure. Like I'm down because like I've always felt like I've had a story to tell, Absolutely. and I've always felt like I want to motivate others. But it, it, essentially, it was just like trapped around the people who were uh, right uh, right around me like, in my actual circle. So like no one was really really seeing like the back end of it. Like they're seeing the front end of it like via my social media. 
Right. And it, it may come off a little bit flashy, but like that's just a small piece of me, <laughs> like and the luxuries that I can actually like afford myself from time to time. But right. like the journey has been a fucking beast, bro. And like the journey is the most important story that needs to be told versus, you know, the the glitz and glamour of it all. And I think, you know, Gary talks about that same thing. He's always talking about the journey uh, versus like the actual, like the bling bling. And Oh, absolutely. The process is everything. Like yeah, I'm loving process, figuring yeah. shit out. I'm, like me DMing people and people responding Yeah, is the craziest shit, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm doing my research on folks. Like I was following you for a little bit. I said, "Oh, let me see what this this cat's about," and I'm I'm looking for you no know, entrepreneurs. And I'm saying, "Oh, I bet." I said, "This cat called himself Philly. Cool. What, what else is going on?" And I'm following you, and you have a swag, but it wasn't a cocky swag. It wasn't like a showy swag. No yeah. doubt, you you have you have pics in there with some badass cars or whatever and stuff like that, <laughs> which is cool. But it wasn't like your normal joint when cats just have the money phone. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I can't really do that whole thing, man. I, people who put money to their ear are usually fucking broken, some real shit. <laughs> right. And that's my thing. So when I, when I, when I saw you, she says, you know what? Let me see what's up. And that's why I, I do the whole, the whole email packet to people first. Yeah. To see if their bio is, is good. And I'm like, yo, let's, let's, let's hook something up. Let's do it. Let me hear you see your story a little bit. And I really don't have a question. It's just a big, it's this conversation we're having. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Cause that's, that's the biggest thing is this. And like I said, my, my whole thing is giving people a platform that's minorities. Um, brown people wave is coming. It's, it's here. It's you know coming, what I'm saying? Man. Full force. And, 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 and if we don't have a proper platform to discuss things, to promote stuff, um, to show people, yo, there is someone out there just like me that looks like me, that sounds yeah. like me, but he's doing it or she's doing it before me, then I can do it too. Absolutely. Because that's that's what it fucking takes. It takes just one person, one person's story, to flip the script on somebody. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, man. It, 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 there's just so many opportunities, man, and there's there's so much free information out there. There's really no excuse to be doing something you hate when you could be doing something you love. Honestly. Absolutely. Like, it's just this is a like this 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 generation. I don't even think they realize how lucky they they have it. Like, like you and I were a little bit older, so we grew right. up where like we we grew up in a time where you didn't have <laughs> um, like a, a bro, whole, let, me, let me let me tell you something, bro. Like, information right at your fingertips. <laughs> no, nah, like the, the biggest thing I, back in the day, the only thing you had was your Rolodex, That's uh, it. and that was your network. You know what I'm saying, and. and Instagram, when I'm using Instagram, is as my Rolodex now. And everybody I meet who come on the podcast, yeah. I tell them, I said, we're fam now, bro. You know, don't, don't be a fucking stranger. You know, if you have something popping off, I expect you to hit me up like, yo, yo, Johnny, yo, I got some new shit. I want to talk about it. What can we make, you know, put me on. And that's what I want. I want, I want people to get to know who Philly is. So then they want to know Philly's story, not just from now, but ongoing. Like, yeah. who, who, what's, what Philly's doing? Six months from a year from now, what has changed in Philly's life that now we're going to talk about it again? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, man. I'm to down. show that, down. yeah, to show that fucking growth because at the end of the day, if we don't support each other, bro, if we don't do these type of things. Then at that point, we're just hating on each other. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Absolutely. And that's not what it's about. And we hated, you know, our our culture, especially with hip hop. Hip hop culture is huge. Like you know, I, I uh, interview a lot of underground artists, and I did that by design. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because anybody could get. A mega star, and 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 people are already attracted to them, know everything about them, but no one gets to see how people are really struggling to become that artist. Yeah, man. And, and what artistry is really about, because the the term a starving artist is real. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So real. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So so you know, fucking real, bro. I know. To bring light to that, but people have a day job, but they're at the club in the evening on open mic night is huge. Like I had a, I had this great. Um, performer from Detroit. Her name was AJ. Uh, her name is AJ420. Yeah, I saw her on your page. I checked it out. Yeah, and she has cerebral palsy, bro. She's yeah, from she's from India, and she's doing her thing. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And when I find artists like that, I say, yo, I gotta give love. I gotta give respect. Let's let's put you on. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, I found this cat named Shevin out in Kansas City in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. He's dope as hell. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like. This is this is what's up. This is what I'm looking for. And this is what I'm listening to now. Like, no doubt I still have my old golden era hip hop. I still listen to a lot of brand new shit too. Yeah. But now I'm, I'm really heavy in the underground cats. 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Every, every listening to how they're so raw because that's all they got. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, man. It's all about their, their struggle and the story right now. So they're coming out with six, seven mixtapes at a time. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And you you hear it, their success in their music as well as they grow. You know what I'm saying? So. Yeah, man. I, I definitely like find like I, I think I'm along, I'm thinking along the same lines. Like honestly, like with these, especially with some of these new rappers, uh, like 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 for for me, like my one of my favorite rapper nowadays is like Nipsey Hussle. But yeah. like I'm more I I find myself not only interested in his music, but interested in like the process he went through to get right. to where he is. Yeah. Like, I find that extremely interesting, almost more interesting than his music. Like I love his stuff. Like, I bang it in the car, I bang it when I'm working out, like, I'm just in the house, I'm chilling, I'll turn some Nipsey on, but, like, if he does, like, a like a, a vlog or a, an interview, uh, anything that's, like, visual that I can, like, pull up on YouTube, like, I'm so tuned into that because he talks about his process, and I feel like it's just so important, like, and it's so authentic, that's why he's been, like, the success he is, and the individuals, some of these younger individuals, like, like the Takashi 6 9s who end up subscribing to a narrative that's just not authentic to who they really are right. end up in the situations they're in because yeah. they you, it's you have you weren't playing you weren't being who you really are from the jump you're trying to fit no, into now cause now could now 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 twitter or black twitter now is is hating on takashi right <laughs> yeah because they're saying he's a snitch right but then i spoke to a couple of heads and i'm like yo if if you knew you already had a hit on you yeah someone to murk you right yeah. And possibly hurt your fam. Are you not gonna try to hit them back the, the best way you can? I mean, yeah. I, I, obviously, you're behind bars. You can't. You can't get at them physically. So if that means working with so and so to knock these motherfuckers back, yeah. Then <laughs> yeah. What? No. What do. I mean, you know. Now, if you was truly, truly loyal and there was no hit on you, and then you snitched, then that's a different conversation. Uh, to me, at least, I think because. I grew up in Brooklyn Tompkins Projects. I grew up a block away from Jay-Z. He was in Marcy Projects. Yeah. And Best Eye was a, was a bad fucking place. And okay. the, the loyalty thing with the whole snitching shit is like, yo, if you're down with it and no one's like coming at you to kill you, you know what I'm saying? Pretty much it's like, yo, then you loyal, then you just, you don't know nothing. Yeah. But man. If, if, you, if you got a hit, if, so, yeah, if someone got a mark on you, yeah, then how am I going to be loyal to that when... You trying yeah, to kill me, bro? <laughs> it's not like, yo, oh, come on, man. Like, you gotta think about it. Like, these are the same individuals that kidnapped him. Yeah. <laughs> like, what the fuck? Like, yeah. come on, man. I had, there's no more loyalty after I found out no. one you kidnapped. You were the behind my kidnapping, and then two, the FBI has wiretapped conversations in which you're talking about fucking offing me. Like, there's no more loyalty. It's done. It's a wrap. Like, yeah. you're not loyal to me at that point. So if you if you're trying to kill me behind my back, then what, what the fuck is going on? But again, I'm 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 of the old school, and a lot of cats that I see that's that's talking about it, I've never been in the hood hood. Yeah. <laughs> never really understand that. Of course, they they heard the, they heard the story of you know don't snitch, mm-hmm. you know snitches get stitches type of shit. But it's like if you don't experience it, then you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Then just stay shut, cause to really be in the hood ain't no fucking joke. To play you're in the hood is a wholly different look, a different whole story. different thing, man. Like people who are in the hood don't want to be in the hood. <laughs> they want to get no, out. It's not fucking cool. So people who glorify it is like, yo, like what the fuck are you doing, bro? Like it's it's not a good move when you don't know when your next fucking meal is gonna come. <laughs> yeah, man. And then you you end up thinking about doing the worst possible yeah. options to try to get that next meal, like. Still snatching a purse, sticking yeah. up a convenience store, like that's yeah. fucking rock bottom type of thinking. Like, I, like, like I literally have to do what I have to do to eat today. Like, that's not fun. And there's no, nothing not. to glorify about that. No, it's not. That's why I know when a lot of these cats they they, uh, they kind of glorify shit like that. And I pause. I'm like, yo, do you really know what the fuck you're doing? Because it's, it's not a sexy thing to emulate someone who's been so impoverished and so put down as far as even as a minority and then put there in a position to where you won't be able to succeed that a supermarket is not even in your community. Yeah, bro. That that's some real shit when you're getting your food from a fucking gas station or from a fucking corner store. <laughs> Crazy, bro. I'm you know already what I'm saying? Hit, man. I'm yeah. already hit, man. I, I I just from my perspective, man, I just think that sticking to 
authentically sticking to like who you are, like your DNA is, is just always a winning equation. Like stick to who you are, be authentic to you, like, like tell your truth and like execute against your truth. Like you'll be fine and whatever you really want to do, man. Right. No, absolutely, bro. Like, so where do you, where do you find your fucking motivation? Like, and, and what is, I guess, what is your process? Like, if you have an idea, mm-hmm. what, what, do, what do you do to begin that process to, to make it come to reality? Yeah. And it's funny that you asked me that. Cause I literally had a conversation with a friend from the, from the UK about this. Like she just asked me how, how to like get her idea from like, conception to consumption right right so like for me the process is i have an idea and usually that idea stems from creating some white space in a lane in which there you know there's not there there's this but it could be better if i implemented this so i immediately go into doing some research which usually consists of me uh looking up something similar taking a look at like the ins and outs the services that particular uh, brand provides, how it's laid out, uh, the the process of going through acquiring the service and exactly what they're doing, and then trying to use the good things and then implement some of my own niche ideas into those good things that will make my particular service or brand or whatever stand out from the rest, right? Right. So, the first part of it is having an idea. The second part is doing some research. And the third part is uh, making it tangible. Like I said, like I feel like making it tangible can, can be something as easy as putting it on paper. Like I have an idea, it's on, it's on paper, and the, and the actual uh, business strategy is there. I have marketing there. I have the mission statement. I have advertising. I have potential investments. I have projected how much working capital I need to get this thing going. I, I have projected how much I need to sustain it. I projected right. how much equity I'm willing to part with for investors. Like all of that makes everything tangible because when you come to someone that's serious about business and you tell them you have an idea, if they don't ask, the first thing they're going to ask you, the first thing I would ask you is, do you have a business plan? And if you don't, I'm not even going to fucking take you serious. You haven't even made it tangible for yourself. So there's no, like, like you're probably not going to end up executing this whole thing properly if you don't have it down on paper, if you don't have an exact idea of how you want to make your, put, like, make your idea go from just have it being a dream to going to being something that actual can, like, comes to fruition in the end. So that's, that's essentially my process. Have an idea, do some research, make it tangible. And then uh, execution. I mean, the last step is obviously execution, man. Yeah, no, that's that's great advice, bro. Like, that's that's mad solid. Like, and you would think as simple as you, you laid it out, because it sounds it sounds step by step. I think what happens a lot of times people get so caught up in the goal, yeah, but they don't worry about the steps of how to get there. And to me, I think the steps trying to get there is is, is better is, is is more important than the goal. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right, so it's like someone trying to climb Mount Everest, know that they want to get to the summit, but there's a lot of shit before you get up there. <laughs> yeah, like, like first you got to go to the store and buy some gear. You buy some gear, buy a plane ticket. Yeah, like, <laughs> find a fucking tour guide that's gonna take you up the mountain. You know, you know, get some other people with you. Like you know, you know, it's like you gotta get some bread, make sure you're good. Like. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of stuff, a lot of steps I think people get so overwhelmed. And I, I, I'm glad you said everything you said because that's how I break down my process. So yeah. when I'm doing my podcast or my book or whatever else I'm working on, it's all about the steps it takes me to get there. So once I have my goal, now I'm writing down every step that it's going to take for me, mm-hmm. and whether that is investment for myself or from others. You know what I'm saying? And it's not just monetary. It's also time. Like yes. how much investment of time I'm going to put into this That's if I do have a day job. Bro, I'm so glad you said that, man, because I find that a lot of people, when they they, they come to me with great ideas, like their, their biggest 
complain or like they feel like their biggest hurdle is the fact that they don't have money to really put their plan into place or put their idea into fucking go mode, right? But I'm like, look, if you don't have the money, you don't have the money right now. You just have to make some f- sacrifices in the form of like 80, 20, right? So yep. I know that I have an idea I want to fucking bring to life, but I don't have the money for it right now. So right now I have to make the sacrifice of 80%. I'm working a regular fucking nine to five. I'm going out. I'm fucking washing the dishes, busting the tables, whatever the case is. And then when I get home at five o'clock, I'm taking care of the house from five to six to seven. And then for the rest of the night, that 20% consists of me working on my goals, like working on my real aspirations. You don't have to have any, you don't have to have a dime in the bank to make your fucking idea tangible, putting it on paper. You don't have to have a dime in the bank to do the research. So it's like when you ask people, like, what have you done? Like here in America, I can I can sign up for an LLC and it doesn't cost me a fucking dime. Right. So, like, I, I, I get it if you don't have the money, but like to, to, to have still have nothing but an idea whenever you're you're passionate about your idea. There's no excuse. There's too much like your time doesn't cost anything. Your energy doesn't cost anything. No, you're absolutely right. But like, you hit. He hit all the nails right there in the coffin because it's like when I get off of work, I still got my day job. I'm already because I also edit for my wife's ch- YouTube channel. Okay. So I help her produce that. We I edit it. Then I'm I, then I'm I'm on IG on my phone. Yeah. I'm looking at people, researching people. I'm I'm DMing people. Uh-huh. Like I gotta put the work in. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Because yeah. if you don't put the fucking work in, the results are not going to come. Never. Or you're not going to get the result that you desire because you didn't put the work in. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, man. I, I think a lot of people just find themselves standing in, standing in place on their ideas, even the great ideas. Like You could have the best idea in the world, but if you don't execute, and if you don't put in the work, and if you're just stuck in on the fact that you already know you don't have money to like make it come to life, you you might as well just don't even mention your idea to anybody because it doesn't matter. No, you're right. And it's all about, it's all about sacrifice, bro. It's all about sacrifice and and how to use it. And, you know, when I really started putting this podcast together, I had nine people fucking listen. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. Month after month, I'm huge about analytics and stuff and shit like that. And I'm, I'm reading the raw data. I'm getting it down. I'm dissecting it. I'm like, yo, I bet. Nine people listen. How the yeah. fuck am I gonna get more people to listen? You know what I'm okay. gonna do? I'm gonna be fucking consistent. Let me keep on putting shit out. Yeah, bro. Let me keep on posting shit and 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 advertising myself. You know, say on my own IG. And I said, you know what? I'm not gonna do all platforms. I'm gonna focus on one. Okay. But I did. I did set up all other platforms: YouTube, Twitter. You'll find Giant Nomad with the same logo and everything. Yeah, consistency you know is key. And then from there, I just kept on, I kept on, I kept on until one day I had an idea. I said, you know what? I want to get a guest on here. Yeah. How am I going to do that? I was like, bet. I looked at my IG, there's millions of people on this motherfucker. I'm going to hit somebody <laughs> up. <Yeah. laughs> someone's going to say, yeah, because people feel themselves. So I'm like, yo, someone's going to say, yeah. yeah so, bro. right? So I was like, fuck it, let me do it. And I started off with my nephew. He's a Christian DJ yeah. named DJ Michael. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yo, I need you. And then I did one of my boys. He's actually from Brooklyn as well. Oh, head. His name is Coach Q. He's a former boxer. Okay. Right? Yeah. I, I put him on. We were in the back of a warehouse with my iPhone doing it. And so now I have equipment. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I have, yeah. I have proper mics. Even me and wifey have another podcast called Couples Corner we do together. Okay. That's what's and, up. And we got Flipboard as our sponsor in that one. You know what oh, I'm saying? Oh, nice. Nice. So, the moves are happening because we made the fucking moves and we have to stop moving. And we're not even worried about the funds. I'm not worried about making money right now. Yeah. What I'm worried about is making sure I'm creating my brand, creating awareness of my brand. Because uh-huh. that, that's going to fucking come later on. The money's going to come later on. It's going to come, man. Patience. Patience exactly. is first. I feel like this younger generation, they look for instant gratification in everything that they fucking do. And it's just the wrong way to have an outlook you, on life. But you know why, bro? Because there's also the generation, not to hate on them, but this is also the generation that got trophies for, for not winning. 
Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm That's why I know you're a Gary V fan, man. He talks <laughs> on eighth place trophies like a motherfucker. Right. So, you know what I'm saying? When 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 you're taking these motherfuckers out when they lose for pizza and, and ice cream, still no. Like my but my kids right now. I got little ones too. Like if they lose. I'm not going to reward you. You fucking lost. You need to feel that pain of losing. Yeah, so you know how it feels to win when you fucking you need to grind more. You need to work harder to fucking win. Yeah, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like, Michael Jordan got cut from high school basketball. One of the greatest players ever. Yeah. You know, you know what I'm saying? To show them out. He wasn't number one round pick either. No. You know what I'm saying? That's Look so important. Fuck- like, if he would never have felt that pain of, like, being cut from this high school team, would he have, would he have like, took that year off to like really work on his fucking skill to like to be the great player he is now? You never know. You know, it could have honestly Yo, like changed the entire direction he was going in. Absolutely. Even with Kobe, even after the game was over, he was still shooting another thousand fucking shots. After. That's dedication, man. Real that's dedication. what you. That's what you have to do, bro. Like that's what people don't understand. Like these cats are not focused about the money. They're so absorbed about their particular process and what they need to do to be the best and that's what you need to do figure out what the fuck you want to do be the best at it but you're only in competition with yourself honestly yeah yeah man it's like there's just so much like every there's not a whole lot new under the sun man like there's a lot of people who have the same ideas of you as you or have the same ambitions as you but like the difference is execution yeah. <laughs> like like Reebok and Nike are both selling sneakers but do you think like they don't they realize that they're other than the fact that they realize they're competitors like they're not they don't really care like Reebok does not give a fuck what Nike's doing and vice versa because no. like they realize that their particular brand of execution and the way they execute their the, the, the sneaker from like the ground zero to having an athlete wear it on their feet like they believe their particular execution is better than nike so i don't like i'm not really giving a fuck what nike's doing and, and you shouldn't have yeah because there's gonna be an audience for them the same as an audience for nike you know what i'm saying and, and same for under armor right so it's like for all those different brands you're always gonna have a one two punch maybe even a third one right you have ups fedex and dh dhl yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, you have what um, Home Depot, Lowe's, and Ace Hardware. These are no sponsors of mine whatsoever. I'm just naming companies out. <laughs> <laughs> just to let people know. Yeah. But to your point, they don't give a fuck what they're doing. All I know is that I have this. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna. I don't like. No doubt, I listen to other podcasters because I'm learning. I yeah. want to gain knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. But then I'm going to spit it my way anyway and find out, yo, okay, I think I have it. I know what the fuck I'm doing. Cool, bet. Here we go. Boom. Let's lay it out. Let's just do it. Because like, today I put up a post on IG mm-hmm. and I put um to the effect that, uh, you know, I read my books. I watched my videos. Yeah. Now I, I just need to apply my shit now. I just need to apply what the fuck I learned now. Like, just do it. Yeah. I think that's one a thing that's like more adults kind of find that I, I find like more adults are doing is like they get stuck in their research phase too much and they just don't want to take the risk to like pull the trigger on whatever their idea is right. or whatever they want to actually do, like whatever their ambitions are. And I and I just like I know like I, like I think the best like metaphor that you can like explain is like one that Gary uses in which you say like if you want the results of push ups, I can't read about how push-ups are done i have to actually do push-ups <laughs> right exactly and so it's like if you, you can read about push-ups all day but if you want the results you have to switch from doing the research and start doing the damn push-ups absolutely man <laughs> so, and, and no doubt research has its place right it, it's it's about for me and i've never been a true advocate of school yeah i, mean, I, I mean, dropped out of school i i dropped out of school ninth grade got my GED years later uh-huh. um I am today even to my kids you want to go to school it's up to you I think you could go after what you want to go after yeah and which is truly what you want to go after and me, me and their mom kind of disagree on a lot of stuff because she's very traditional okay um but that's why I divorced her but anyway uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh-huh. <laughs> that's one reason why but um you know it's to, to know what you want to go after it, but also mm-hmm. to know what you have to do to survive is totally two different things. So if you know you, you can't make money off what you want to do right now, you got to do the day job. 
right? Yeah. And to your point earlier, you got to take the time you do have and go after it. What stops people and what motivates people is the same thing, but it's kind of crazy. It's called fear, yeah. right? Yeah. That fear could, could, could either be a positive or a negative for somebody, which is crazy weird. So for me, the fear pushes me and it motivates me and i'm like oh shit and to me motivation is very is very fickle that's the, that's the beginning stage of movement yeah right that's like the first fuel that you get mm-hmm. and people say oh well I, I signed up for the gym i worked out for two months and now i don't know what happened i lost my motivation yeah. no shit sherlock because you don't have no fucking, you need to have drive after the motivation now yeah. you know what i'm saying you got to have that purpose to say yo i'm gonna still grind out because you cannot be the best at what you do, Philly, mm-hmm. but because you're consistent and do it, and 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 so and like you said with the execution and, and kill it with execution, and someone behind you could do it better, but since they don't have the consistency of execution, they're gonna wind up failing. Yeah, and that and that's what happens all the time, right? It's not so much being the best at something; it's always about hey, who, who does it longer, who's who's figured something out mm-hmm. so they can be on top, and that's what it comes out to be. Absolutely agree, man. Absolutely agree. Yo, bro, it's uh, you know, th- chopping it up with you is is phenomenal because, like I said, because you know you're a black man, right? Yeah. Doing your fucking thing, and sharing your knowledge is huge, bro. Man, I appreciate you having me on this thing, man. I I I intend to absolutely intend to do uh, like another couple podcasts with you. Plus, I can. I can plug you in with a couple other individuals who would lo- I, I'm sure would love to like give you some insight on their particular journey, like people that I was served with that are you know, k- killing it in the entrepreneur game right now. Absolutely. That, yeah, man. I'm going to plug you in with my brother. Um, I, His name is Karan. We call him Stack. He's got a brand called Wash that just got off of the Feeling and Fashion Week um, runway and shot a, uh, a pilot for a reality TV show. That I was like, like, kind of a part of. Yeah, he's killing it, bro. It's on, it's gonna be on Cox Network. Um, they're they're shopping it around right now to some major networks. But, Dude, um, yeah, yeah, put me on. I would love that. You don't have to. I, I thank you for that, bro. Like, no, that'd be amazing. I would love to get him on if he's willing to do it. Yeah. Um, even some veterans who maybe are still, you know, serving as well. You know, I would love to speak to more veterans because, um, I don't think the veterans get enough light. There's not really yeah, a true yeah. platform for other veterans, you know what I'm saying? Um, I'm not sure there's other platforms out there, but you know, I want to give a lot of people insight to what it's like to you know to be in the military to, to try to transition that like we talked about earlier. Yeah, you know, because there's not a lot of great success stories that you hear, such as yourself. Bro, you know what I'm saying? I got a, I got so many people I can really recommend you to. For, like, I, you know, have you ever heard of the watch company Original Grain? I have, yeah. I, I know the owners of that. They were they were the, the owner was my troop when I was in the Marine Corps. He was a lance corporal. I was his sergeant. Wow, dude. That's um, my that's my little brother. Wow, that's insane, bro. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I could plug you in with him too. I can let you talk to him. I'm sure he would love to share his story too. <laughs> no, yeah, that's let's let's connect. You know what I'm saying offline and let's speak and um yeah let's make that happen, bro. Like yeah, definitely I'm down with that, bro. Yeah, man. Shout out to Andrew. Shout out to Andrew Beltran, Original Grain, man. I love your watches, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, let people know where they can find you, bro. Oh, uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm available on a few platforms, man. I don't really subscribe to a whole bunch of them, but for Instagram is dare, D A R E, the number two, Excel. At, and then um, Twitter is the same, at dare to Excel, D A R E, two, E X C E L. Yo, man. <laughs> I I love chopping up with you. Like, thank you so much, Philly, for uh, for coming through, and uh, giving me your time because you didn't have to. It's a it's a mid afternoon Saturday afternoon right now <laughs> for people who don't know. <laughs> yeah. And man. for you to take your time out.